Welcome to the What's Your Weird Story podcast. Everyone has at least one good story. And some of us have stories that are just to the left of normal. We're interested in the ones that push the boundaries of what we can perceive. Stories that defy explanations. Stories with an air of mystery. Stories we might not share. For fear of being thought of differently. But don't worry. We're all friends here. So, what's What's your your weird story? story? Hello, Weirdsville. This is Jeff Howard, a resident Bigfoot expert and voice of the listener. And uh, with me here today, I've got uh, your two co-hosts, Barry Johnston. Yo. And Adam Beebe. Hello, hello. How's it going today, guys? It is, you know, Jeff, it's going really good now that we finally were able to get you to record that intro and everything work out. Yeah. We tried every every room in the house. Every, yeah. <laughs> every computer, phone, and tablet. I don't know. With podcasting, man, you know, it's always something. So. Yeah. yeah, and plus I think it's hard because the... We already know that they're throttling down the, the Wi-Fi usage. That's just part of the deal because everybody's home. So everybody's sucking yeah, up the Internet. Every, everybody's yeah. on right now all over the world, everywhere. Yeah. Zooming, uh, yeah. Google Google Hangouting, mm-hmm. yeah. GoTo yeah. Meeting, yeah. Skype. Yep. Skype, yeah. You know what I've been doing, guys? I've been watching this crazy-ass uh, documentary on Hulu about uh pazuzu remember our old we had a couple of guests on that had pazuzu stories uh oh they, yes the brookshire yeah. boys yeah and who, uh they're that's, in that's right. salem and so i guess i think it's done through vice they went and they did like a i think it's like a five or six part documentary they go way deep on him and and give more insight talk to his close friends and mm-hmm. they and they um they shine a light on to kind of obviously his mental illness, but just how far reaching his mental illness was. Right. And, and people just amazing that, that just people sort of dismiss that, you know, and, and, and just, especially his friends, you know, they didn't think anything, right. anything, anything of it, but if you guys haven't had a chance to watch it, you should watch it. Cause it's really an interesting look into someone who is just completely missed by the system you know uh mm-hmm. you know and his and his own family they weren't able to rein him in and in fact mm-hmm. sort of turn their back it's about a small town or a, a you know a, a decently sized uh small town that uh police department just completely drops the ball and mm-hmm. uh and allows him to do what he did it's pretty crazy it's just a crazy story so anybody interested in that should check it out yeah, man, I I dig the serial killer stuff. I I really do. How many victims did he have? He had three, three that, yeah. that they know of, and now he claims, and other people around him claim that he it, there could have been more, but three that they know of for sure. Wow, it's really it's disturbing on so many levels because of the way that it was treated. The case was treated by the police department as like, oh, these are just made up stories that people are saying. You know, and they never really did go check it out. And so that led him to just do whatever he wanted. He thought he was untouchable. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, wild stuff, man. But as soon as that I saw, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, man, dude, I know about Pazuzu. I'm going to check it out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's wild. Yeah. Man. You guys been doing anything uh, cool? Interesting? No, nah, man. I mean. Go ahead, Hub. Oh no, I, I really haven't been. I I just I try to get outside as often as I can. Uh, I've really been wanting to go on a hike, but uh, I tried to last weekend. I called a, one of my favorite state parks just to see, you know, if 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 they've been having a lot of visitors, and they said, yeah, uh, they're chock full, even more so than usual mm-hmm. on every week. So, so I'm just going to stay away. I don't know. I might just go out to the farm and hike around. Uh, you know, that's probably would be safer to do yeah. go out to Altona right. and just walk around. 
That is probably the best thing to do. Altona is uh, uh, Jeff's uh, grandfather's farm. One of his, one of them. We used to go camping out there. A lot of, a lot of wild, weird times <laughs> happened there. A lot of sure. beer, a lot of that beer, is. a lot of beer being drank. Out a lot there. of beer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and a lot yeah. of yeah. I Let's, I've seen. Um, I'm going to call him out for a few behaviors here. Well, just maybe uh, Jeff at one point wanted to get on Survivor. Um, he wanted to get on Survivor real bad. That's true. He, he um he made a tape. Were you my cameraman? Uh, I was there for part of it, but not okay. all of it because I was um. I was in North Carolina at the time, but my uh, then girlfriend and I came down and we watched you do this. So Jeff made this tape. And this is back when Jeff had like long hair. He looked long hair past his shoulders. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, gorgeous manicured, well taken care of. Like oh, yeah, spent more time on his damn hair than any woman had ever. I mean, <laughs> Good God, waiting for him to just finish drying his hair and getting it all prepped to go out and just drive around town was <laughs> an hour and a half affair, me talking with his mom and his dad. But I digress. Jeff decided that he's going to get on Survivor, so he wanted to make this tape. So uh, he gets this tape, and he talks about how we went out to his grandpa's farm, Altona. And, um, and so he... he Sets it up to look like, well, I'm just out here now and I'm going to start building me a fire pit and all this stuff, you know, the survival stuff. And then he um, he got him a uh, he, got, he made himself a loincloth <laughs> and uh, he steps down to the loincloth, bunches himself up with dirt and mud. And so now it's like, well, I've been out here for three days. Well, it only been like 30 minutes, right? I've been out here for like three days. I'm really... A, you know, adopting to the land and really getting in tune with nature. I'm getting a little hungry, but I think I, I rigged up a, a trap for a rabbit. And so uh, I got that going. And then, um, so then it was like cut to the next scene or whatever. And it's uh, at night and there's this fire going and Jeff had, you know, he, he had caught a rabbit, but I think you shot it or something, but uh, right. <laughs> he, uh, he cleans it. And it shows you, I think you cleaned it some. I can't remember if you cleaned it on tape or not, but um, he put it over the fire and he squat down there in front of the fire um, talking about how he's, you know, how he did it, all the cleaning and everything and cooking. And he had kept doing this take over and over and over again. <laughs> and finally, we realized that the rabbit had been on the fire for so long that it had like burned to a crisp and was uh. falling off the spit <laughs> that he had it on. So <laughs> how did that work Man, out? <laughs> Uh, well, I never did send the tape in. Oh, man. <laughs> no, I know it, damn it. But I'll bet you a copy of that still exists. I should. Oh, man. I should. <laughs> we need I forgot that. about that. That's yeah, funny. that just uh, that was one thing. In fact, that was a safer version of a story that I was going to tell a different story. But that that seems more humiliating and yet also appropriate for That's perfect. Our show. That's perfect. <laughs> That is so oh, funny. Quarantine survivor. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. We're all in survivor now. <laughs> but um, so one of the best things, though, about you know this quarantine is you, people are being able to spend time with their families immediately, but also get like us get on these uh, communication platforms, you know, FaceTime and Zoom and all of that, and Skype that we use, and talk to people that. You know, they haven't seen it in a while. Yep. And that's what we have for today. Exactly, guys. I'm so excited for our guest today. This is uh, this is an old friend of Adam and I's from from college. He's he's an esteemed gentleman. He's he's a journalist. He's an author. He has a couple more books in the work in the works. He's a university professor. He holds multiple degrees in many different disciplines. He's a one-time mobile DJ and also a former nightclub owner. He's a world traveler and an expat. He's also a hasher and a one-time pimp. 
He's also <laughs> he's also the coolest and least annoying juggalo that you'll ever meet. <laughs> also, a second place finisher in a Mexican beers. Uh, search for the world's most interesting man, <laughs> my friend, Nut, Nut and Bone, George Samuel Nearing, if you will, Sam Nearing. Thanks for joining us, good buddy. What's your weird story? I I know what Story Hub wants to hear, and it, it's nuts, and it, it, it's a bit of a long one. And to thank goodness, I we're, we're not on a time constraint. No, no. I'm at seventy. So we're good. Um, good. And I have plenty of refills. So, uh, yeah, like, like you said, man, I, I've been teaching in Asia. I left here in uh, January 31st, 2002. I went to Korea. And uh, it was just, it was on a whim. I had finished my second degree. I didn't really know what I was going to do. I'd lined up a job in Oklahoma City with this guy that we knew and his roommate that we kind of knew and they were uh uh they 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 were people who sold goods that other people wanted mm. and uh, <laughs> they, they were in a commodity oh okay. uh, <laughs> supplies uh, and uh, I, they had told me I could come live with them. They had like this condo with an A-frame attic that was carpeted that I couldn't stand up in, like on my knees. Yeah, well, like, Sam, yeah, like, Sam is also extremely like, tall. What are you like six, <coughs> six, four, six, six four. four? Wow, yeah, he's six, taller six, than me. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he, he's a, he's a, he's a tall boy. So. Sorry, I want to interject that as well. No, no, no. Any, any time, dude, because you know I'm going to wind for a while here. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a small little thing, and there was just yeah, unroll a sleeping bag. You can stay with us for free. That way, like we look more legit. I'm like, I don't know how like me being there helps you look legit. <laughs> I, I, I had lined up what was probably like the the one job in the world that's lower than being like a professional terrorist or a toilet paper hoarder. I was going to be a telemarketer in Oklahoma city. <laughs> oh yeah. And I was like, man, like this is, this is where my life's gotten to. I don't know what to do with this. And it wasn't supposed to start for a while, but I'm hanging out at my parents out in Weatherford one morning on a Sunday and I'm going through the one ads in the, the Sunday paper. Cause I'm like, there's gotta be something else out there. Like I'm still just desperately like, please. And I come across this ad. It says, come teach English at a private foreign language high school in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, it's a three year high school, four year degree required teaching experience preferred. I'm like, well, man, I got two four year degrees. I'll do this. I'll apply for this. <laughs> Now, at this point in my life, I've never been on a plane before. I, I've definitely never been on the, the, the other side of a desk in a classroom. Um, no teaching credentials whatsoever. I've got business and journalism are my degrees. And so I was like, yeah, man, I'll just apply as a joke. Yeah, And, and how much uh, Korean w did you also have? <laughs> Well, I had seen just about every episode of MASH, so, I mean, I had that going. <laughs> Quite a bit, yeah. That was a long-running uh, series. Oh, yeah, like, almost, like 270 episodes yeah, or something? Yeah, a, yeah. Series. Over, 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 over 10 years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. But all all I knew about the all I knew about Korea at the time was that there'd been a TV show I'd watched the hell out of. Uh, they had at one point hosted the Olympics, but I don't care about any sports whatsoever so i didn't know when and my father had been in the war and that was it that was like the sum total of my korean knowledge oh and that they may or may not eat cats and dogs <laughs> so with that like you know truckload of knowledge i sent off my application to this guy up in edmund <laughs> And then a few nights later, I'm out at the bar drinking with my boys, uh, E-Boy and Red Brett. And, and I'm telling them this story. I'm like, hey, hey, guys, hey, I applied to be an English teacher in Korea. <laughs> How crazy is that? And we all had a good laugh and cleaned our glasses. And a while later, I get a call from this guy. And he's like, hey, man, you want to interview? And I'm like, okay, sure. And so this same thing goes by, man. We're back at the bar on the weekend, clinking glass. Like, guess what, guys? That job, they want to interview. Ha, 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 And at the time, I had hair down on my butt. I, man, I've, I've never been like, 
I'm, I'm not going to be on the cover of GQ. I went up to meet this guy who'd been <laughs> head of the Department of English at one of our big universities. And I come up in like some, a secondhand jacket that I bought at the et cetera shop. This, uh, it's just like Mormon, uh, not a Mennonite, Mennonite run shop in town of secondhand goods. So the biggest interview in my life, I've got this secondhand jacket. I've got a knockoff Salvador Dali print tie. And again, this long, long hair. It's like, all right, this is going to go really well. So I do the interview. Were you wearing your 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 trademark uh, bone necklace at this point? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> he just held it up, by the way. That's everybody. great. <laughs> but the bone back then was still the party bone. It it was not a, the bone was not an everyday thing back then. You know, the, the bone only went on me if I had something in it, and so the bone was not in play. But. I, I get a call back from him. He's like, hey, we're going to do a second interview. And I'm like, oh, my God. So here we are back at the bar again. <laughs> he called for a second interview. Clink, drink. And we do another interview. And this goes on. And he's asking me to fill out uh, an application for a passport. And we're buying my first plane ticket. And I've been playing this up for over a month and a half. Just a, co- a continual joke with my friends and and finally, uh, January 2002 comes around, and we're having a farewell party for me and my parents' house, and the majority of people there thought it was just, it was the culmination of this weird joke, because I, I used to do, like, this long-running, like, nonsensical things, whether it was some kind of a joke or, or delivering pizza, or I just, I did a lot of weird stuff, and I people didn't believe me until they saw the bags and the the ticket and the passport and and also like guys you know sayonara that you know I'm gonna say goodbye in Japanese when I go to Korea because that's what I know about Korea I can only speak Japanese. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea it was gonna last as long as it did when when you left, Sam. Oh, I. I only went to Korea for one year. It just took me 14 years to figure out that it was the 15th year I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get over there and I had a glorious 18 months. I, I stayed at this job. The job was horrible. Uh, we were way underpaid. It, it was just, it, it's a whole nother what's your weird. I mean, I, I, I there's so much in, wrapped around this place and just like insane drama and and like a, eh, not, not exactly violence, but it, it got really weird, man. So I decided 18 months in, I was like, man, I love Korea. Like, I really enjoy being here, but I don't want to work at this place anymore. So I ended up applying for and landing a gig at a university southeast of Seoul, like as far southeast as you can be and still claim that you're living in the suburbs. So I I get the gig because at the time, the universities in Korea weren't really, they were coming out of the Asian economic crisis of the late 90s, and they really couldn't afford to get people who had master's. If you had a bachelor's and three years of uh, experience teaching, you could generally get a university gig. Mm, Wow. So, yeah, I was like, man, thank goodness for low standards. (laughs) 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 It's like you're you're the motto for your life, I think, Sam. (laughs) This my second semester at the high school. The guy who hired me told me that yeah, uh, my my roommate and I were the best he could find at the time. <laughs> like yes, <laughs> I yeah, and yeah, build me up, Buttercup. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd gotten this thing, and even though they wanted three years, I'd applied anyway because the high school I worked at had been like it had this really good reputation. And like I was doing some privates on the sly and that I was able to command like a higher salary per hour for that than other people were only because I'd worked at this place. And I just like, man, I worked at blah, blah, high school. And like, oh, really? Here's 50 bucks an hour to come teach my kid. Well, like people I knew that worked at the private academies were making like 25 to 35 an hour. So like, this is all right. Yeah. So I I get this high, uh, the college gig. 
even though I've got half the experience they want. But again, I just flashed that name of that school and they're like, oh, blah, blah, high school. Come on down. <laughs> so I do it. I pull the trigger. And I'm like, all right, man, here, I'm going to change jobs and, and I'm going to leave my school. And when you change jobs over there, you have to change your visa. And to change a visa, you got to do what they call a visa run, because you can't change your visa in that country. And this is pretty general for, like, I, I assume, anywhere just about, because I, I knew people like across Asia, Southeast Asia, that were doing this. And to do a visa run, you literally just have to leave the country. You just, you got to go find, like, your, your country's consulate or embassy in wherever you're going. So I had to find like a Korean consulate or embassy. And usually everybody go to Japan because it's like a 90 minute flight or less than 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I do this. And it leads to a debacle of just epically stupid proportions. <laughs> This is one of one of one of my favorite stories of all time. And I think I I'm actually I'm gonna switch off the, the cranium for a minute here and I'm gonna try and read the pages I've got of this just so it's a little more comprehensive. Like uh, as, as Mr. Hubbard said earlier, man, I, I write, I'm an author. <laughs> of course in this self <laughs> Who isn't? Who doesn't have a book under their belt? So I, I wrote this book called Ninjalicious, the fictional autobiography of Richard Lickman. And it is a definitely 100%, thank goodness they can't see me wink on the radio, uh, fictional account of things that happened from 1984 to 2002 out in western Oklahoma, man. Like it was the end of an age. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm working on a sequel now, and it's a f definitely fictional account of 18 months in Korea in 2002-2003. And it ends with the beginning of this story. <clears throat> so, August 27th, on a Wednesday. Much like my last ill-fated trip to Thailand, this ill-fated trip began with a wasted attempt to get to Incheon International Airport in time to catch a flight off the world's only landlocked island. Let's step back in time to the day before, Tuesday. Raquel, my coordinator's assistant at Gangnam Style University, the school <laughs> I've been was to start working at, names changed, protected guilty, obviously, I informed me that the paperwork I needed to make my visa run to Japan would be at the school by mid-afternoon Wednesday. Every teacher changing jobs, not of Korean heritage or married to Korean, must exit the country to get their passport stamped at the South Korean Embassy or Consulate. A quick jaunt to Japan can complete this requirement. The man who was supposed to bring my paperwork down from Seoul by 2 p.m. didn't arrive until 5. I'd been sitting packed and ready to go, drinking glasses of Commander Rum, a painfully cheap rum sold on our military bases in the commissary, and Chilsung Cider, Korea's 7-Up Sprite hybrid for, at, for four hours. Uh... I slipped into the straps of my backpack and picked up my documents from the administration building on campus. And from there, I walked in a steady rain down through the campus to the road past the school's mountainous. Uh, we, we, were on the, we were on the side of a mountain. That is horrific. I waited 20 minutes for my bus to the Castle Hotel in Suwon from where I jumped a boarded bus to the airport. It came as no surprise to me that I found no more flights available for the evening because I don't plan ahead and just like, ah. Oh, it's one of the world's busiest airports. There'll just be a flight because it's only 90 minutes away. <laughs> I also thought I'd be there three hours earlier. You know, not, not the best at planning. <clears throat> My four-hour trip to the airport turned into an, another overnight stay in Airport Town Square, a small city that they've constructed around the airport. I walked around trying to feel out a bar to serve as my hotel for part of the night before switching over to an internet cafe to complete the evening and get caught up on my writing. As per the norm, I had no idea what I was in for. I found a bar that looked promising and ordered a pitcher of beer mixed with apple flavoring as they enjoy there. I wrote my journal through the first three mugs. The pitcher had a small compartment in the bottom for dry ice and water, creating a mist that poured out over the top via a tube running its length. Wow. This turned my writing space into an eerie tabletop graveyard. My hand cramping, I traded my journal for a book I had about panzer battles of World War II. 
I didn't get very far along before a guy sitting across from me, one of the only three other customers in the joint, tried to place his order in English, which is how I came to met Mike, a gyopo. And a gyopo is a Korean word for like Korean Americans. So, you know, Korean ancestry, but American citizens. <clears throat> Mike's in the army. And he's in town to escort one of his buddies to the airport. <coughs> the buddy had elected to spend his last night in Korea horizontally with his wife in their motel room. Mike didn't mind too much. I really wish I hadn't found out why later on. We downed another two pitchers as he broke down life as a gyopo serving in his motherland. Both up for a change of scenery, we went out to seek adventure and alcohol, or so I had thought. My new acquaintance declared it was time for sex. I didn't know this and thought he was joking until we walked up to the front door of a place he apparently had visited before in previous escort trips to the city. I couldn't believe that he'd actually brought me to a whorehouse. Not used to seeing one contained in a building with minus the large bay windows they usually have in, inside the city. Uh, I went inside so as not to leave the story hanging. We had stepped into a large lobby. There was a far cry from the flop house I had expected. The elegant, elegantly dressed Mama-san recognized Mike as she walked out to greet us from a back room. She moved across the floor of plexiglass, allowing a view of the very well-thought-out fish and lotus pond beneath. Soft lighting in various colors created an intriguing ambiance that worked its mojo in a futile but valiant effort to convince even a full-fledged anti-pay for six persons, such as myself, to stay and spend my money in seed. Mike tried his best to talk me into staying <laughs> by explaining that all massages here cost the same, so I should just get a massage. If I changed my mind before the unhappy conclusion, I could make it happy. Unable to buy into the idea of a way overpriced massage, I left him to his fun with the promise of meeting in the morning to catch a ride with him and his friends to the airport in the military shuttle bus. So you're still you're in Japan, right? You're we're in Japan. Oh, no, oh, no. God. He hasn't oh, even gotten oh, on the airplane. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. It's the pain meds, man. It's the pain meds. That's okay, Barry. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> Barry's gonna love Fuck. this episode when he hears it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Barry, it takes me like five miles to get to the destination that's a mile away. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> it's great. It's terrific. <laughs> so, uh, jumping back into it? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, Thursday morning, I stayed the rest of the night slumped in a ratty office chair at an internet cafe for a thousand won an hour, where I slept uh, after drinking two cast beer nightcaps. As I arranged previously, I met Mike and his buddy and his wife at the hotel two blocks away to catch an army van to the airport. An army, a Korean armored SWAT vehicle greeted us outside where we parted ways. I went down to the basement to hopefully purchase a ticket for Osaka, Japan. I hit up the first travel agency I came across and booked the earliest flight out four hours away. <laughs> <laughs> that was a burp. <laughs> that can stay in. That can stay in. <laughs> burp your ABC, Sam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, I, I can't do the, the trick I used to do out of the other end with a lighter on the radio, so. <laughs> Sam had the most combustible <clears throat> farts of anybody I've ever seen do it, man. I'm eating. I've seen shooting out like a Roman candle almost, you know. And, it's like, yeah. and he would stop, drop, and do that shit anywhere. I, we were in anywhere. fucking Walmart one time, and he fucking got down in the aisle and fucking lit a fart on fire. He never missed one. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I never burned my anal hair or my underwear. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That is one of the things Chairman Weiss has told me I'm no longer allowed to do. <laughs> <laughs> that and play Rochambeau with one of our army friends. But anyway, I digress. So I checked in and prepared to fly. In my case, this means consuming quantities of alcohol sufficient to inebriate a small herd of pachyderms. It was 10 a.m. and Sbarro's was open. 
I stopped in for a slice to grease my innards and soak up some of the booze. Bouncing around the different bars lined in the terminal, I found my gate. I found the Korean Air Lounge and went up to get a great beer, to find a great bar. A video game arcade <laughs> a great beer, a great bar, one of the two. A video game arcade set opposite the cafe and television lounge to the left. The bartenders even allowed me to take my beer mug to play the games. The machines didn't operate using coins. Instead, they took a prepaid card. And what would later dawn on me to be a horrible irony, I played an ambulance driving simulation game for 20 minutes. My departure <laughs> time neared. My apprehension grew, and my liver swam in the high tide I'd created for it. I bought more reading material at the terminal bookstore, a Korean phrase book because I was going to Japan, and Stephen King's <laughs> from a Buick 8. I hit the last two bars on my way down the terminal. At the first, I asked for a glass of water and a beer, ever conscious of my body's occasional non-alcoholic fluid requirements. The bartender handed me two mugs. I promptly chugged most of the water, which I then spewed all over her <laughs> and the counter. Oh. <laughs> I scream at the startled wet woman. Well, is that again? Do that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ahem. <laughs> I miss you guys. Holy crap. <laughs> Here we go. I screamed at the startled wet woman. She had given me a mug of water two degrees from boiling. The flesh oh. from my mouth esophagus had turned to a hot gooey slag oh. I got here to compensate and walked out once i realized she would never understand why the strange foreigner had gone all mouth it's all over her and her place of work <laughs> I, the plan. I do so hate those four words especially in the present tense for me that subject verb article and object always spell doom this time it would be different but in a most unpleasant and drastic manner I found my seat at one of the emergency exits as per the request I make for every flight. I enjoy the extra leg room and want to be the first off in the case of any of my plethora of nightmares coming true. <laughs> <coughs> the plane began to taxi into position for takeoff. My knuckles turned corpse white in their death grip on the arms of my seat. The engines roared as they charged in preparation to defy physics. Korean Air's aluminum tube of wiring and fuel blasted off with force enough to convince me I'd accidentally boarded a space shuttle instead of my scheduled flight. <laughs> <laughs> Realization reared its ugly head. I'd forgotten to take my dose of out of van. I pried my right hand from the armrest and pulled the blue bottle out of my pocket. My left hand and wouldn't cooperate, so I used my mouth to open the child and airline traveler-proof cap. Half of its load of tiny white pills spilled into my shaking hand like bland Skittles falling from the sky in their commercials. I tried to put them back in the bottle. Some spilled, some landed in my hand. The ones unfortunate enough to stay in my hand soon joined the beer in my gut. One, two, three, five hundred, I honestly don't know. I was in no position to play the count from Sesame Street. I needed doctor prescribed calm, and I needed an hour ago. The scene was set for my time saving airline airplane trip to Japan to fall apart. It didn't let me down. Eighty minutes later, our plane rolled into the Osaka airport. Minutes later, I was in line in immigration. Immigration decided that in my current state, I was a quarantine hazard. They took my backpack and they sedated and thrown into an ambulance bound for a nearby hospital. Welcome to Japan, Mr. Lickman. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, because the book's name is Mr. Lickman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Richard now Lickman is uh, the fake name I adopt for these stories. And also, there, there are. This is uh, the next to final editing. It would be important to mention here that there was also a duty-free bottle of Bombay Sapphire gin that disappeared during those ninety minutes. So I was definitely oh, man. not as good as a man can Whoa. be. <laughs> Weren't wasn't your mouth 
I, I remember your mouth was scalded from the water, and in your inebriated condition, they were trying to talk to you at customs, and your oh, yeah. tongue had swollen. <laughs> Everything was burned. It was like, why are you here? <laughs> What? I just know you're going to think that I know who I am. It's just, I, I, was, I was a walking nightmare. I couldn't speak and I, they couldn't understand me. And I definitely like was not in the greatest of mental or physical <laughs> health by that point as everything that I'd consumed started to kick in. And so they just hauled me away. Oh, man. It, it was. Had they, had they turned into like anime versions of people at this point? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> How far gone were you? <laughs> Enough that they quarantined me. I, mean, I don't like. I don't know what that is. Like, I, I honestly, I don't know how to. There, there's no. Oh man, remember that time we were at what's this guy's house and we did that thing and we were all crazy and you know like oh he passed out and he threw up in the toilet and he had sex with the couch or whatever the hell like there's no like there was no quantification for this other than that they quarantined me. <laughs> right. And, uh, and also, I'm, you have this you have this six foot four American with long hair, uh, you know, down to his ass. He's wearing a bone around his neck. He, he can't fucking talk. And he's <laughs> trying to enter your country. It's great. And so it's great. looks like a half shaved Yeti. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. In, in a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> but, you know. Hunter S. Thompson is my guy. I'm <laughs> probably trying to figure out how the hell you got on a plane in the first place. <laughs> right, so there's, there's no way this man could have got that crazy in 90 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> is that a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Accepted and succeeded. <laughs> so... I came to in a hospital bed with all manners of needles and ivy <laughs> protruding from my unwilling flesh. I did what any other kidnapping victim would do. I freaked, plain and simple. I spazzed down on a level heretofore unlike any other I've ever known. I yanked out their attempts to invade my body. I don't know how much damage I'd achieved or what all I broke, but it makes me feel better as I look back at how proactive I was. A security detachment tackled me and the nurse dragged me back into unconsciousness. <laughs> my mind came back online as I found myself standing in a subway station wearing a hospital gown a Japanese man with almost no English motioned for me to wait for someone to bring my backpack I waited my pack arrived the man who delivered it demanded payment for a hospital bill he held I had brought very little cash on this adventure, planning on living out of ATMs for the weekend. I had no desire to pay for my own abduction, but knew I had to distract myself from the situation. He directed to an ATM, but like they do in Korea, it closes at midnight, which uh, the, both countries close their ATMs at midnight for the most nefarious of reasons. Uh, married men, or I guess men in general, uh, they, they get drunk at these like work parties, and then the second party they call Icha in Korea mm. is you go with your coworkers to whorehouses or like uh, their their karaoke is called Norebang and it literally means singing room. And you get like a private room in this dingy office building and like girls come in and you just sit there and like with your coworkers sitting next to you, uh, <laughs> there's handy action. Wow. Or more. <laughs> So they shut the ATMs down to try to curb that? That is hilarious. That's great. You, you can you can literally screw away all your family's money before midnight, but not after. <laughs> well, they, you know, that's that's that is respectable. I mean, let's mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you can make it to 11:59, you're okay. <laughs> the uh, the Cinderella hour, I believe, is something else. <laughs> I entered an incorrect pin number just in case. <laughs> Dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, back on track. No, you're you're completely correct. <laughs> He asked slash motion for my passport as a guarantee that I would pay the bill. 
At this point, his words sounded as though I was gargling gravel. Of course, oh, sorry. This, <laughs> let, me, let me start that again. He, he asked in motion for my passport as a guarantee that I'd pay the bill. At this point, my words sounded as though I was gargling gravel. <laughs> In my own way, I explained my visa-related issue for visiting his kidnap-happy nation and how I needed it first thing in the morning to take to the Korean consulate or else my trip would have been for naught. He seemed to understand and accepted my return ticket instead and waved a piece of paper at me with a phone number scrawled on it. I snatched the paper and my pack as I wondered how the heck I would get out of there with no cash. He loaned me 3,000 yen. It's like, I don't know, 30 bucks? Wow. The final running of the subway that night would deliver me to Namba Station, the closest to the Korean consulate. I had an... I had no intention of ever seeing that man again. I figured I could claim I'd lost my ticket at the airport and have it replaced. I fell asleep as if spending the day drugged out hadn't left me rested enough and magically awoke at my station. I stepped off the train with far less money than I could hope to find a hotel with. I was still in my hospital gown, and that's when Mike appeared out of thin, hallucinogenic air. <laughs> Hey everybody, you're listening to the What's Your Weird Story podcast. You probably knew that already because you're listening or downloaded to the episode off of your iTunes or your Spotify or whatever place you get your podcast from. We want to thank you for listening. We also want to remind you to like us, follow us, subscribe to us, make sure that you get your new podcast episode every week. We'd also like to ask you to rate and review so that we can grow our audience and we can have more friends, we can have more stories. So thanks for listening to What's Your Weird Story. This is my, you randomly run into, you know, massage Mike from earlier. Oh, yeah, there, there are multiple mics. <laughs> Wait, this is a different mic or the this same mic? No, no, that was Korean American Mike who is in our military mic <laughs> this is a whole different brand of okay. <laughs> <laughs> at 51 mike had been living in japan for 19 years he was still every bit as much the california surfer boy he was before leaving the states i thought it was odd and maybe a sign too that i'd met two california boys named mike in a span of 24 hours in two different countries this might inform me that he was light years out of his mind on a couple of drops of liquid LSD. Oh, man, dude. <laughs> oh, that's great. Wow. Well, this is like this is like a uh, 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 Hunter S. Thompson kind of a deal going on right now, man. Yeah, it's a great fuck. It's a great fucking story. <laughs> But in Japan, <laughs> and when I nearly survived, <laughs> there's bats. <laughs> miles. Oh God. Uh, um. This. Oh wait, wait sorry. Ah. Uh, most other people probably would have tried to beg off out of this impending situation, but for me, I saw him as a temporary guardian angel coming to save me. After all, I had just been through. I had. After all, I had been through just trying to get to Japan. The last thing I wanted was to deal with someone who wasn't crazy. Now I wasn't to be let down. Mike had to locate his bicycle before he could go home. Tracking down his bike proved to be a wild goose hunt. As he walked, he stopped at every bike rack we came across to lift each and every bike. We looked out and he found an unchained bicycle on the fifth rack. It became <laughs> his bike. <laughs> pretty painful thing. Are you still in the hospital gown at this point? I want to. I just. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't bother to open my backpack and take like the spare sh shirt. I had th two nights and three days. I brought like one extra shirt. I sure as heck didn't like take time to strip down in the Japanese subway station. So no, I'm just I'm wandering around in like shorts 
because it's August and hot and humid and a hospital gown and yeah, just oh my god, normal as anything. <laughs> and, it, and I think because of how crazy I looked, it's like the only reason like that he and I connected. Had I looked halfway normal, he just would have like let me pass on by. Man, there was no reason to talk to some other like weird normal cracker looking dude. But here I come up out of the station, glazed and dazed in a hospital. <laughs> game. Like I definitely look like the kind of thing you would see tripping that you've got to go confirm <laughs> it's real or not. Dude, this guy probably Sam. This guy probably didn't know if you were real or if you were some kind of kaiju, you know, hanging around. You know, that would normally be playing against <laughs> Godzilla or the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The way you're dressed and decked out, and I'm sure your eyes are just as big as his. So. Wow. I did kick over a hospital room. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he passed on a little of his knowledge of Japanese life after listening to me recant the first chapter of my Japanese experience and my still broken slur of a ver- voice. You know, again, this guy's tripping his balls off, and here I am. You're like, Bobcat Goldwave never sounded so good. <laughs> <laughs> A six-pack of Asahi beer found its way into our hands at a 7-Eleven. Outside his home, he stopped to break down his roommate situation. Four Japanese men, two South Africans, a 50-year-old Filipina, and possibly a few others he wasn't sure about, shared a capsule house. We found the Japanese guys lounging on one side of the black circular couch occupying the majority of their spacious living room. Mike and I cracked open Asahi's and took a seat on the far end of the sofa. He caught up on the day's activities with his roommates and explained what the hell I was doing there. (laughs) I I watched nonsense on the television while they bantered away in fluent Japanese. The South Africans entered, followed shortly by Nelly, the Filipina, and then the the proverbial bukkake hit the fan. (laughs) <laughs> one of the South African guys doesn't like Mike hates him might be a better way to put it they got into a row the two came as close as two people can to fighting without any physical contact yelling and screaming seeing a giant black South African dude my size screaming in Japanese at this little tiny American dude screaming back up at him as his head's fully tilted I, it was just it was mind blowing Uh, So I don't speak Japanese, but they definitely were not telling each other how much they loved each other. Uh, The situation finally abated, and the South Africans stomped off to his quote-unquote room. I never did learn the cause of the foul cloud between them, but it made for a strange sight to see this insane action as I sit there trying to come out of the haze, drink a beer, and defend myself from the come-ons of Miss Nellie. 50 years old or so, she was the only person not enraged who spoke English. She'd been in uh, Japan for three years while her husband was in the Philippines. Uh, But apparently she was open to, you know, (laughs) she was open to some American fun in Japan, which I denied. (laughs) I mean, she was only twice my age. What are you going to (laughs) do? Before going to sleep on the couch, I made a thorough search of my bag to ensure my meager possessions were intact, and they were not. When the airport authorities took my bag before kidnapping me, they took my, uh, we called cell phones hand phones in Korea. So this is like a flip phone, and this is in 2003, man. When I left Korea, I'd never seen like a color phone before. Like, you know, I had the, the Nokia bar phone that had all colors, black and green on the screen. (laughs) <laughs> my high school students had these cute little flip phones that had like 64,000 colors on them and a camera. But I don't know what they did with the pictures because they didn't like, you know, hook them up to the Internet or download them. They just they, they were on the phone until you lost it or replaced it. There's just uh, billions of disposable Korean photos out there, I guess. But uh, 
I had I finally broke down and got a phone in Korea, uh, and now I didn't have one. And they took this like little shoulder bag I carry around with like beer and phone, and I always have a camera with me. And the bag was gone. Uh, it had little value except that my journal was in there because I, I I write a lot. Like I filled 170 journals, and my journal and my favorite pen were gone. So I was very not happy. Yeah. And they took my current journal, not just my backup, but the one that I'd been writing in for quite a while. It just had all sorts of, you know, <laughs> these kind of stories. Um, I, I was enraged. I just, this was, you know, the poop icing on the poop cake. So it also had like, I, because we didn't have the the MySpace so much back then or the face nuggets and all that stuff. Like I, I captured everybody's emails and phone numbers in this book. And so it was gone. And uh, I had like ideas for writings, just everything, man. It was, it was very depressing. I, I, I really didn't know how to handle that. Um, so they yanked it and it pissed me off more than Jerry Falwell at a Marilyn Mansard concert to, you know, stick with the times. <laughs> <laughs> so pissed off more than a Montana militia. I went to sleep on this weird drugged out guy's couch. I wake up Friday mornings on Mike's couch with a clear head and level of anger that had dropped approximately to the intensity of our sun. I showered and thought again about the funhouse layout of Mike's pad. So, have you guys ever heard of a capsule house? No. No. It is this, it's this mental Japanese invention where you're short on space and, and rent is obscenely high. So to like just go on a, like in a, a regular apartment or even like an efficiency apartment is out of the, the scope for a lot of people. So somebody came up with this nonsense where you have a lot of roommates and not a, like you have big common space, but very little personal space. <clears throat> so the front door of Mike's place opened into a spacious living room divided from the large kitchen by a long counter. A small hall behind the kitchen leads to a T-junction with a sink and two toilet closets to the left and a shower stall and two more toilets on the right. Lockers line the wall opposite, except for a doorway on the left, which opens to reveal a hallway containing the bedrooms. Mike and his roomies rent space in this capsule house, and instead of like individual like bedrooms and proper living spaces, they each get like the the kitchen and the living room to share and they get a locker to store their possessions so imagine like like when you were in high school and you had that locker like now as a grown-ass adult that's where you get to put all your stuff wow <laughs> that's your home well then in that back area where you had these these things called the capsules where they get their name the place gets its name uh each person gets a capsule and it's literally like this cheap sleeping chamber that goes back into the wall uh, with a room like a, for a sleeping pad it's like less than a single like basically like a baby bed man maybe like three wow. feet by three feet square that sinks back into the wall and on the door you, you get like a padlock so you can throw stuff in there in the day and hope that nobody locks you in overnight I, I could just see like man if, if we had ever, if if we had traveled to Japan together, I guarantee you we would have gotten drunk one night and just like randomly locked one or more of us in these places. <laughs> so you get the sleeping chamber, and, and looking down the uh, the hall at the row of these fourteen capsules stacked in pairs, I couldn't help but think about how awkward it would have been to have a bottom hole and sleep beneath people having sex, let alone even attempting to like be the person who brings home somebody to have sex in one of these things. Yeah, like, no you know, kidding. Come back to my hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, could you even fit in one of those things? Or how far were your feet sticking out? Well, I, I slept on the couch because like, right. I there was no access to the ones that weren't occupied. And uh, no, they, they were definitely way too shallow for me, man. Yeah, I would have been ankles out or or I would have had to have been like curled in the fetal position all night long. Yeah, it just, man, it was not kosher for me. 
Wow. They, they even have hotels like that. Yeah. And in the hotels, there's like TV monitors that hang down from the ceiling. So you can sit there in the hole with your head pointed forward and like watch whatever, you know, weird graphic pseudo porn game show they have going on. But like the, the episode of The Simpsons, you know, we, we don't reward winners. We punish losers. Right. 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 And man, <laughs> I spent a weekend losing. <laughs> <laughs> And the girl, the babysitter girl, she picked up the phone and there was a policeman on the other side. And he said, we've tracked the phone call and it's coming from inside the house. Whoa. Yeah, dude. I love those urban legend stories. Dude, I do too. And you remember the one where the girl, it's always the babysitter or it's the kids making out in Lover's Lane. But there's the one with the girl comes up and she finds the kids are watching TV and she turns them around and their face has SpaghettiOs. Oh, man. Or the hook guy. Remember the oh, hook the guy? Hook. The hook was hanging from the rear view yeah. mirror. Yeah. Yeah. So if you got a story that is similar to any of those awesome urban legends, we want to hear it. Because, you know, those urban legends, man, they started off as somebody's true life weird story. It's got to be true somewhere. Okay. All right, so you were um, <clears throat> you had woken up, and you were telling us you're describing the capsules and everything. Mm-hmm. And I was ready to get the hell out, man. Mm. Like <laughs> daylight's wasting, and and I got a thing to do, and it's determined. It's like my next my next job. This is all all important. Mm-hmm. So I think hospitality gives me directions to Korean consulate because it's in his neighborhood. And he tells me to come back when I'm done and I can sleep on the couch for another night. And he hit me up with a drop of acid. I said, I think about it, <laughs> shouldered my gear and bugged out. I mean, I don't know. The idea of watching him argue with his roommates while I'm like flipping lid was not cool. No, man. So I, I bailed. The sun was out doing her thing and doing it well. Things were looking up. I'd had a, a rare good night's sleep because I'm I'm like really a nasty insomniac. Although I'm going to credit this sleep to like whatever drugs the hospital had thrown into me throughout the day. Uh, I devised a plan to get around paying the hospital bill. You know, the world seemed like it wasn't such a bad place. So I headed off towards the consulate. And... Uh, then heaven found me, man, or I found it. Either way, it didn't matter. So I got to I gotta start at this part with saying that Japan, Japan is this country that loves vending machine and girls dress for a high school uniform yes. fantasy porn. Right. Uh, just everywhere you go. So this is your habit. No matter the age. Just, actually, well, it's the vending machine. <laughs> and it's the vending machine and the... Capita, I mean, I'm a You don't have to man, cover so up. I, I you don't have to... You don't have to cover up the cam to discuss the your uh, your, you know, your fetishes <laughs> about uh, vending machines. Oh, oh, that's, Japanese that's my phone strap did. on. Yeah, it's totally fine, man. Well, you know, the, we're not we're not shaming you for what you're into, stuff. dude. I mean, you know, hey, man, skirts and stuff. No, but it was it was the idea of these vending machines that are everywhere, and they sold beer, beer and vending machines. <laughs> You know, this is in 2003, like when all you could get was 3.2 water in Oklahoma stores. Yeah. Like this, this was just, ah, you know, I, I found my niche in the world. I, I know where I now belong. And it was pumping coins into Japanese vending machines <laughs> for beer. And so, candy. yeah, beer and pain. I never saw the panties. I looked because I was like, man, I got to find some back for the hashers, which. The hash house here is a whole another group of stories. Yeah, well, I had I had written that down. I don't think we're going to have time tonight for that. <laughs> oh God! But, uh, it, I've got so many things written down saying we're going to have to have you back on yeah, at some know. point. Well, the the Takate gonorrhea is keeping me in America for a lot longer than planned. So I think we've got time to do this, brother. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, kind of beer vending machine. So the, the land of the rising sun has approximately three vending machines per human being. Coin-operated machines line their streets like whores in Amsterdam. These coin-op wonders of the mechanical age don't offer the greatest variety of choices. I'd say that 90% of them are split between drinks and cigarettes. 
And the drinks can be anything from colas and canteens to milk drinks and juices. Uh, any one of the coffee nail coffin nail machines offered as much varieties of carcinogens as the smoke shops in western Oklahoma. But Japan's other 10% offered beer. I dropped 100 yen into a slot and plucked out my 135 milliliter, which is like a 4.5 ounces, so like a half can of Asahi. I never thought any country could be as cool as this. I considered spending the rest of the day, if not my life, in front of that machine and eventually proposing to it, but other missions awaited me. <laughs> and then, of course, I, I failed to locate the proverbial you know, panty machine, which is, again, not... I really don't need strangers' underwear. So I was cool with that. So I found the Korean consulate, and it had a surprise. Yeah, how come you went air quotes around don't need? So <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a podcast, and only the three of you could have seen that. And they weren't supposed to know. <laughs> the ghostress beat it. How dare you call me out on my nonsense? <laughs> Uh, now this is the point where I understand why you wanted to do this as a video chat hmm. <laughs> I, I understand so I find the Korean consulate I walk past the armed guard at the main gate and through a four foot Korean flag I go down a flight of stairs into the visa office and I find this guy named Stoney and he was the other guy that had been hired at my university with me. So he's there getting his visa. And he's this Kanukistanian dude, which was my word for Canada. Or Canada. Uh, I, I had an altercation with the country of Can Canada a while back, and I renamed their people and their land. Again, yet another story. <laughs> <laughs> and Stoney was the cool guy. We talked once, and uh, so I, I run into him at the consulate. <clears throat> So uh, neither one of us had any other plans, and so we decided, like, we'd team up for the day. And our first priority was food after we dropped off our passports and the paperwork. And, you know, I hadn't eaten since whatever, whatever handful of pills and bottle of sapphire I'd had on the flight and <laughs> mug of hot water. And granted, credit to this guy. I mean, it's only been 24 hours. So I still just sound like mush, mush mouth from the fat album. I'm like, ah! <laughs> Mushmouth and Boomhauer had a kid, and that was me for a few days. <laughs> it just, yeah, it was, it was ugly, but it was like, oh, I, I work with this guy. And, and in a minute, you'll understand why he was also okay hanging out with me. So, Have you changed out of the, uh, the hospital gown yet? <laughs> I put on the other shirt that I'd had. I, okay. you know, I, I'd showered in the capsule. Like I'm, I'm as clean as I can be, and and in fresh clothing. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all dolled up. I'm ready for the ball, baby. <laughs> That's that, the ball. That the vending machine team. really did impress you. <laughs> oh, I, I wish it had like a GPS locator or something. Like I, I would have gone back and paid respects annually to that thing. <laughs> I. I, I've been, that was like the first time I think I've ever truly been in love. <laughs> so that week. we decided <laughs> that we got, there was an empty bottle of Mad Dog 2020 at my high school yeah. graduation that got thrown into the woods and I tried it over. Yeah, I've, I've had great loves. Um, <laughs> we, we go out and we're like, man, here's a diner. So not really knowing what it is, like we, we go inside and it looked normal for a diner. It had like an open kitchen at the by, at the back of the building. It had like this peninsular counter coming out, uh, and had some waitresses on the other side of the counter doing their thing. And uh, it was pretty packed. So we we like try to figure out how to order because there was no notepads. It was just the the women were delivering food. And finally, like the the waitress points towards the other side of the door where we'd entered, and there's yet another vending machine because you know japan the sign above it had this like fading food pictures and names in japanese and their prices and a machine's corresponding letter number combination so we we put in our money we 
punched our selections and the machine dumped out the printed ticket for each item. And we had to hand those to the waitress who eventually came back with our food. And so we got like a beef and noodle bowl for 200, like less than two bucks, and, you know, three, three and a half dollars sahi beer. So we ate, we chilled, we tried to catch up, but it was mostly me listening because every time he asked me a question, I just, <laughs> yeah, I was quite the conversationalist. So it was noon by the time we finished. Passports wouldn't be ready until 4, 4 p.m. So I'd scrapped like whatever missions that I'd written down in my journal that the airline had looted. I, I didn't know, you know what all I was going to do. And so he decided that like we'd you know, reprioritize whatever it was I'd had planned going. And we were just going to go walk around and do some shopping and hanging. And I was like, well, that's fine, man. As long as we can find a place where I can get a new journal, which, again, I don't know if he understood me. And it was like the craziest mall. It was this monster beast of an open air place that, that had a covering. It was, it made like, like if you combined like AMC and uh, old Paris, these flea markets in Oklahoma City, like smash them together and maybe triple it. it. It was just, I've never seen anything this large and this intense. And narrow little walkways through everything and just people everywhere selling everything and just people moving everything. It was immense. It was incomprehensible. And it was all in Japanese. So we, we found like food and jewelry, books, computers, cell phones, cellos, massages. I mean, just a galaxy of nonsense. Uh, video game arcades, pachinko parlors. Uh, the video games were like a lot more expensive than in the U.S. or Korea at the time. Like, it was like a dollar to play a quarter game that in the States. And they had all the, like, do you, you guys know Pachinko? Yeah. Yeah. Where they drop balls yeah. in there. Right. And with the, I didn't know this. They're gambling machines. Mm -hmm. But you can't gamble. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you drop your ball through this thing, and it, like, bounces around, and you get more little metal balls at the end, like a, a really weird Asian version of the Price is Right's Plinko. And you, you get all these things, and it pops out tickets. And like like you're in an arcade, uh, so they are sorry they're not not the tickets, but the balls are the tickets. And so you take them and they weigh them at the counter, and they have prizes, like you're at the the mall arcades, you know, where you can get like a, a pencil eraser for five thousand tickets, or you know, a gasoline rag stuffed animal for thirty thousand tickets. But here it's all the front. You take your prizes around to the back, and there's this window, and they exchange the prizes for the cash that you should have won for gambling. A hell of a setup. That's nice. <laughs> but they get around it. You you play the pachinko, you won the balls, you traded them for a prize, and then by going around the back, you're just selling the prizes to a interested party who, quote-unquote, sells the prizes back to the pachinko parlor. Right, they right, right. So yeah, I would I would never take like one of those stuffed animals to a kid because Lord knows like how many people have won it and you know had their hands on it and of course they're all smoking there too. I mean just uh. so we go through this place and and we're just not finding like I don't know what Stony was looking for and because he was kind of glazed over and like man he he looks like way crazier than me this a guy named Stony and you don't know what he's looking for. <laughs> Wow, Stoney's <laughs> not his name, but for the sake of this, he, he's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, yeah, all right. True, true, true that. So, we walk around. I, I'm like, man, I, I finally find like this cheap journal that seems like it'll be okay. And we were like, man, we need beer. Well, across the street from the Korean consulate, it's a bar called the Pig and Whistle. So we go in there and we're like, man, if we order beers while we're waiting, we can run across the street, grab our paperwork, be done with the consulate, come back and drink for a while. So we do that. We, we left our beer on the table and, and everybody was OK with us, like running away for a moment. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, man, at, at the consulate, like you come back at 4 p.m. So no matter what the line is, everything, we... We finally got our stuff. We waited a lot longer, but our beers are still there. Thank goodness. Uh, which apparently were Coronas. That's weird. 
We had like fish and chip specials and I don't know. So we're like, what are we going to do this evening? And this guy, Stoney, he's like, man, I got this Japanese friend. And I'm like, oh, like a friend, like, like you gentlemen, people I've known for a long time. I trust with secrets of my life, although apparently after this i have none uh you know it's just people he's like no this apparently this is a guy he met on one airplane flight a japanese man named yuji and he's like if you're ever in japan give me a shout we'll hang so i didn't realize like this is a one-off dude he met on a plane so he's like all right we're gonna hang out with this guy later i'm like man i I, 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 i'm like so we're trying to find a place to stay and the rooms are crazy uh, like they wanted fifty dollars for like cheap T-shirts. It, it was just it was nuts. Again, in two thousand three, mm. so Stony had stayed at a capsule hotel the night before, um, and he paid thirty dollars for that just to sleep in like a little you know sleeping bag hole. He didn't want to stay there again because he was also hoping to get lucky, and uh, he knew he couldn't do that in the, the he couldn't do that in a capsule. So we're walking through this area and they're talking like 140 bucks a night or more for a room. And it's not you know, like we're not in downtown Tokyo or anything, man. We're in some weird area of Osaka. There's faded signs, broken neon. And so we set off in search of a better deal. Five blocks of almost nothing but hotels surprised us off the side road. So we had an idea that these might be the type of hotels where you take a woman at the night for not the whole evening. But we didn't care as long as they were affordable. I mean, like, Korea's got a lot of these love motels where you can just stay at, and they're really super cheap and semi-clean-ish. And so I was like, that's fine, man. Like, if they're cheap, we'll do it. And so everyone manning the desk gave us these really queer looks, man. They were not (laughs) cool with the two of us walking in there and we, we didn't realize what was going on. And so we split up and I entered a place called the Christmas hotel. And I finally was able to figure out why and confirm my suspicions. So, you know, I opened the door it's a six story building and I'm assaulted by an unholy life-size Santa Claus sitting at a piano emitting a horrendous Japanese Christmas song. And again, this is late August. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cheesy decorations gave the hotel an internal Christmas theme that had been set up since the first Christmas. The desk clerk looked at me, looked to my right, looked to my left, and then looked at me again with a game of gestures. I, and then I learned that these hotels rent out the rooms by the hour, any time of day or night, but they won't rent the rooms out for the full night until after 10 p.m. Hmm. They're t- trying to get like all that hourly all action, the action they can get yeah, yeah. Okay. that makes sense that makes sense oh yeah so you know it gets people time to get home to their wives i don't know uh and also they wouldn't admit you without a female companion which would explain why every time stoney and i walked in together ah. they all went to, yeah <laughs> uh, and i'm with the long hair so i know who was the female there but <laughs> <laughs> I am not the prettiest of ladies. <laughs> so it was nonsense. So Stoney calls Yuji and he's like telling him about our difficulties trying to find a place. And like, you know, we're not going to be able to meet him or he's not going to be able to meet him for dinner as they planned. So he tells Stoney to meet him in the lobby of this like super fancy hotel. So luckily it was close. We get down there and he's this Japanese businessman that's somewhere in his late twenties to early fifties. And he's just, he's in that mysterious state where you don't know, man, he's semi fresh out of a master's degree or semi close to retirement. And (laughs) just this mysteriously decent looking dude, you've no clue. So Yuji calls the hotel down the road and gives us directions and we go down there and check in and clean up. He got us a sweet deal, 90 bucks for two beds. Uh, so we're happy with this. And it's it's a oddly set up room, but nothing too insane. So we get through this. And we so we're going to skip part of this because it gets very weird in here. I don't know if this is long, but it gets weird. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it gets weird. <laughs> Uh, the name of the show is. <laughs> <laughs> it gets odd. I apologize. It gets odd in here. Uh... 
Hey, that's a nice t-shirt you got on there. Oh, thanks, dude. It's brand new. Do you like that? It's one of the official What's Your Weird Story t-shirts. Where'd you get that? It's funny that you ask. I just got it off the brand new Spreadshirt.com site for the What's Your Weird Story podcast. There's no www. You just go straight to shop.spreadshirt.com backslash what without the apostrophe W-H-A-T-S hyphen Y-E-R dash w-e-i-r-d dash s-t-o-r-y and that'll take you right there i mean you can never own enough clothing well that's true barry there's t-shirts for the ladies because you know they're cut differently there's hoodies which are really cool there's two different kinds of hoodies and there's also tote bags so you can tote your stuff that's so cool man so if you guys go out to spreadshirt.com what's your weird story currently there are two designs but there will be more going up very soon so just keep your eyes out for that and if you decide to get one of our shirts tag yourself on instagram to ours or facebook show your love show us what you got let's see your true colors sex asia monogamy pick which word doesn't fit with the other two Uh, (laughs) i don't know why the two are almost synonymous but they are osaka's many phone booths have their windows blacked out by the hundreds of girly cards taped to them showing airbrushed hotties and phone numbers I'd later learn from UG that these love motels often require a membership to enter and have girls for you to pick out by the hour. So in a city of 9 million, Osaka is not much of a party bar. We found some bars. We found some clubs. They're pretty sparse. Um, a lot of confusing English words. And so... UG knew of some decent restaurant above the pig and whistle across the street from the Korean consulate. It's like, ah, we know how to get there. We'll meet you there. And so somehow they just decided to like, I got thrown into the mix. I, you know, didn't know these folks really well, but here I am all of a sudden going to dinner with these two gentlemen. I'm like, all right, cool, man. Don't have to spend this night alone or with anybody too, like out of their mind on hallucinogenics. So I, I find, uh, Stony showers and he goes out to meet the guy and I run out a little while later after getting cleaned up and I find Stony and Yuji and Yuji's got two young female friends with him, Mariko and Yushima. And this restaurant's pretty nice. I take off my shoes and I step up onto the black wooden floor that serves as a bench around our table. So they've got like this hole under the table and you just kind of Kind of sit on the floor with your legs dangling down. It's like a really cool setup. There's a hole cut for the grill on the table, and they put uh, coals under it to cook your food. So I joined this foursome of folks, and they've got a chilled French Chardonnay next to this hibachi grill with a couple of like seven inch fish roasting over the coals. The girls didn't speak English, but were very nice. Uh, they were probably the two most conservatively dressed women I saw in that city. So I ate a female fish, and I wouldn't have thought about it if the pinhead-sized eggs hadn't burst out of her belly like a horrible scene from Alien when I tore her open with my chopsticks to get to the meat. (laughs) Yushima explained in her own way that it was a good thing, although neither one of them really wanted to talk to me when I answered that. That's a fish. (laughs) So our meal was seven courses. They they know what happens whenever, you know— a giant rampages a city, so they just want to, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Been there, done that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Although I'm going to say Mothra is my favorite, but still. And yeah, they they were cool with it. We go through seven course meal, five bottles of wine. And but during the meal, Yuji had the girls quiet down a couple of times when his wife called. We had sushi, we had fish, substances I weren't, I wasn't too sure of. Um, and when it came time to settle up the tab, Yuji wouldn't hear of us chipping in. He took care of the 280,000 yen meal. It's like, oh, probably 260 bucks or somewhere in there. Yeah, decent food, nice guy. So we, we stroll through this neighborhood of like quiet clubs and bars and he, he finds this place off a side street called Kanso. And it overlooked the side of a small like river that actually looked fairly clean for being in a big city. Uh, 
but it looked more like a yuppie tailgate party in a parking lot <laughs> of a football game than it did a bar. The girls pushed two orange 55-gallon drums together and pulled up five stools in this outdoor area. Eugene and I stepped into the safety orange shack to order alcohol, canned wine coolerish beverages for the women and draft asahi for the men. The inside of the shed reminded me of a general store from the Old West with hundreds of good, different canned goods lining the shelves from floor to ceiling. And at Canso, you purchase a can of munchies with your drinks, and, and they expect you to. Like you're in Asia, you generally eat while you drink. So they had stuff like Popeye's shoestring potatoes, Campbell chicken noodle soup, Van Camp's beanie weenies, wasabi tuna, uh, and a bunch of Japanese things with nonsensical psychedelic pictures that failed to convince, convey any sense of consumables whatsoever. We sat and we talked our way through two rounds in this fenced-off parking lot. About 1.30 a.m., closing time had come and gone. The bartender like waited long enough for, to, for us to leave after uh, taking care of everything else and finally kicked us out. So, Stoney had believed that Yuji, being the generous ma- married man that he was, uh, Stoney had believed that Yushima and Mariko were... What's, what's the proper way to put it? They were gifts for he and I. <laughs> right. So he was. I'm like, oh, this is how the night ends. And this is why our hotel room, it, the two beds weren't in the same room. You walk in the front door of the room and it's split off, and you have like a private room on either side with your single bed. A shared bathroom in the middle. But yeah, so he, he really thought like that was how our night was going to end with. Uh, you know, four of us in this room. He was a bit disappointed when Yuji and the girls took a cab together to somewhere that was not Yuji's home. <laughs> 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 so at this point, Stoney was like, man, I got to see what else is out there. And I, man, that's fine. You do what you want. I'm, I'm dead. Like, you, you, you don't understand the day I've had. Uh, so I, I let him go. I went back to the room and passed out to what have, may have been purple uh, Princess Purple Rain on the TV. I don't know. It was dubbed and weird, and I, it was insane. So I finally pass out. I wake up at 9, and Stoney tried to wake up, but not very successfully. I guess I don't, I don't know what time he'd gotten in, but it, it was a long night for him of God knows what kind of action. So I get up, and apparently the these kind of Japanese hotels, they want you out by 10, or they start charging late fees. Mm. And Stoney had learned this the, the hard way the night before the capsule hotel and had to pay an extra fee that was almost the same price as his room or hole for like less than an hour of time. So like five minutes to spare, he got up and showered. We got out in time. And uh, I didn't know what all was going to happen, man. Like, I've still, I've got this airline hospital thing hanging over my head. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I've got this hospital bill to skip out on. So I decided, man, my ticket was open. So I have this, like, stroke of brilliance. Man, if I just go to the airport, like, a few hours early, because there's a lot of traffic between Korea and Japan. I mean, it's like Oklahoma City, Dallas. It's like, if I just show up, I can just change my ticket and and just grab a plane and go and be safe and, and end the story. So I get to the airport and uh, Stoney decides, you know, he's, he's going to wait a bit. So we part ways. Uh, I get into the airport. I don't know. It's too shy. Sorry. There's, we're trying to condense this a little bit. Because, man, it really does go on. This is an insane. I get to the airport after down in some sushi, and I still can't talk. I mean, I'm, I'm in an information counter. I'm like, all right, I'm missing my journal. I'm missing my phone. So I'll just go to the information counter. This flag, where's my phone? Because now I can talk where you can almost understand. Like, it's quite sexy. So I get in. I, and I'm trying to talk to him. And, of course, the information desk has no, no clue what I'm talking about. 
Like, all right, whatever, man. So I, I just, I go onto the clean air counter. And I'm like, all right, this is it, man. This is the final step of the mission. I'm going to get out of this. I'm not going to pay this horrendous hotel bill. I'm, I'm going to escape to Korea and start the next chapter of my life. Like, I'm on the verge of, I don't know, something incredibly amazing or horrible. I don't know which. So I approach a Korean air counter. And the woman, the agent there, I, I tell her that I, you know, I've lost my ticket and I need some uh, a replacement. And you know, I didn't tell her that somebody was holding it ransom for a hospital fee I neither requested or wanted. Uh, so she tells me no problem. She puts my information in the computer. I'm like, all right, here it is. Like, I, I can see the finish line, man. I've run this marathon through. It's coming to the end. She's going to hit print. She's going to hand me my boarding pass. I'm going to get the hell out of here. Like, this is it, baby. I am all good. It's amazing. Optimism is the edge of a cliff. We all enjoy seeing how far we can step out over without falling backwards. I definitely fell. She turns away. She speaks rapidly in Korean to a clerk with, who has his back to me. And he turns around. And he's quite familiar to me. It was a guy who brought me my bag in the subway. He had my ticket in his hand. So an argument began. So Korean Air had paid my hospital bill. Oh, God. Wow. And I thought it should have stayed that way since I hadn't wanted to go to the hospital in the first place. <laughs> this dude, he demands that I pay the bill. So we argue. He, he starts yelling. Koreans love to yell, man. <laughs> and I, I'm like, all right, I'll yell back. Granted, we're not good at either, each other's language, but we can get some words out here. Um, it was not cool, man. We, we had a standoff because they weren't going to let me on the plane if I didn't pay. And I wasn't going to pay. Also, I had to leave the country. So this is not like a good, it wasn't good for either. Of course, I wanted compensation for my phone and the other gear they'd yanked for me. And they wouldn't budge. I wouldn't budge. Tension, volumes escalated. My flight's about to leave in 20 minutes. I was screwed. Three semesters at that high school had hurt my bank account. And fully aware of the exorbitant cost of healthcare in America and the fact that Japan is way more expensive in general, I, I knew that my ambulance ride, my treatment, my destructive kaiju like rampage and second <laughs> round of whatever they'd done to me was absolutely going to bankrupt me. Like, this is it. I'm, it's early 2003 I'm, I'm 26 years old like all right this is the end of my financial life because lord knows this would be thousands of dollars in america because you know i got no insurance here and i'm like i don't, I don't know what's gonna happen man so finally i'm like all right man i, I don't desire to be stuck in japan like i gotta get the i gotta get back to korea to get the job to pay off my my stupidity here and i recognize that so I'm like, all right, man, give me, give me the bill. Like, and, and at this point, I don't know what I'm paying. So he hands me the tab, and it's 13,580 yen, which at that point is like 130 bucks. <laughs> In poor taste, I threw money at him. I grabbed my change because that was amazing. Told him where he could stick their services and stocked off. I'm a man with an extremely long fuse, but it's attached to a rather large bomb, and they exploded at that Korean air counter. Screw them. I ran to catch a rail car to my terminal as they were announcing my final boarding call. The short jaunt over the East Sea was blissfully uneventful. Flying sober, though, gives me the flu. As soon as I board an aluminum death tube, sober, I go clammy. I squirm in my seat like an elementary student sitting outside the principal's office waiting to get swats. I mean, at least that is in the good old days before political correctness corrupted the minds of Americans and turned so many of us into, you know, fearing wimps. But I return to normal as soon as my feet hit solid ground. But the time spent aboard just completely slaves me. So I got back, got the job. Stoney ended up going to jail for six months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Reverse. <laughs> in Korea, 
Okay, 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 okay. Well, it turned out Stoney was a bit of a pothead. And he'd really? actually taken, yeah, he'd taken a weed <laughs> band, and that's why he was so whacked out and accepting a, of my weirdness because he was just high as hell and just like, all right, like this is what I can handle. And he got caught uh, during our second week working together in Korea. Uh, Korea has these horrifically draconian weed policies. Right. So just like America, still federally, we classify marijuana and heroin together. They're you know Schedule One drugs, but we treat them differently as we should. Uh, Korea has not gotten over that. So they still, if you smoke weed, you're going to jail. But they are hardcore to the point where if you pee positive, that is possession. Wow. Wow. So two weeks into working together, he was out in a city west of us with this Korean dude that he was friends with that was also his dealer. And they're just rolling around in this guy's car together. And the cops have been watching his dealer for a while. They pull him over and they're like, all right, all you ninjas in the car come out and here's a, you know, here's a cup and pee into it. And you know, you piss positive, you go to jail. And he, you know, he had nothing on him. He was, you know, right. Other than his urine, he was completely clean. Damn. That's crazy. He's, yeah, he spent six months in a recently opened foreigner-only jail hanging out with Russian mobsters. Oh, my God. Luckily, his family, there was some Yugoslavian history in his family, and he'd speak just enough words to make some of the mafia cool with him so that they were, like, protective of him. Wow. Since it was a foreigner prison. And, yeah, he never got to go back to his apartment and collect his stuff. Uh, he just, at some point six months later, they're like, all right. Yo, know, here's the airport. Goodbye with yeah, you. Right. Wow. Damn. <laughs> so again. So if you're listening, Stony, you're a good dude, man. That was a raw. <laughs> uh, raw deal. Raw deal, Stony. You got a raw deal, um, man. <laughs> it, but it, it happens. It's not just for the foreigners. It's the Koreans too, man. There was right. a guy. Uh, a Korean blogger a few years later, you know, just some random middle-aged Korean dude that worked at, you know, some company and he had a blog and he had saved up this money and he was doing like this lifelong trip, man, I'm going to Europe. I'm going to travel through, you know, X amount of countries in Europe and experience European culture and make foreign friends. Cause that's like a big thing there, man. You got to check that box. I got to have foreign friends. And uh, he blogged about it the whole time he was there, and he ended up in the Netherlands, and he's hanging in Amsterdam. And he's like, all right, man, you know, here, uh, it's he's writing about it and saying, you know, it's strange here that, like, it's legal and they have cafes for this. But back home, you know, you get busted for the craziest stuff, and, and like, we hate it, and so many countries have it. And it's in popular culture and all this stuff, and so he tried it. And he wrote about his experiences. And Korea uh, continually is like one of the top three consumers of alcohol in the world per capita. Uh And so he's like, how is that and smoking so legal in our country? But this simple, weird, natural herb is not. And he got back to the Incheon airport and they were waiting with some nice, shiny metal wrist cuffs for him and pulled his butt away. Wow. Jesus Genesis five twelve. I have given you all the herbs and seed bearing plants on earth to use, to use, to use, to, to use. use, to use. That was Genesis four twenty. <laughs> uh. So that was it, man. Like I, wow. I paid one hundred and thirty bucks or so for this bill that I thought was going to be thousands of dollars because wow. apparently, as expensive as, as everything in Japan is. Healthcare is not <laughs> right. Wow. And then, Imagine that. Imagine living in a place where healthcare was basically free or cheap, or so f- cheap it was almost that. Wow. For the stupidest among us. That's well, a, then, so that's there's a, a tiny epilogue to this. Okay. Yeah. So sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. But, you're good. You're good. <laughs> late October. I, I'm going through my wallet, and because like the wallet I had at the time had like some weird back. Side, like little back pockets to it, you know, where you occasionally throw some random stuff. And 
I, I discovered the souvenir that I'd tossed in there. And uh, the hospital had given me a hospital card. So it looks like a credit card all written in Japanese. And at the time, I had like these extracurricular classes at the Korean National Police University. And one of my students understood uh, a bit of Japanese. And she told me, like, my name, it had my name on the front, which in Japanese, because they, they can't transliterate us very well, it said, Georgi Ku, Ni Aring Ku. So that was it. Like, man, the hospital gown and that plastic <laughs> card and some track marks were my souvenirs from this insane two nights in Japan. Wow, it's man. Been- it's That's, a great story. That dude. is great. Yeah, it's amazing that the airline paid for your hospital visit. Like how that w- that would have never yeah. happened in this country. We our shit's so scattered. Like you show up to the airport and get a new ticket, you're gone, dude. You know what I mean? There's no way they're gonna track you down. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. And you never saw either one of those journals again. No, no, that's. Uh, you know, I've got 170 of these little books. It was some are big books that I filled over, you know, the last 20 something years because I started that stuff with you guys. Yeah. And uh, I, I just started keeping them all together because I figure one day when at some point in my life, there'll be a trial and the law firm of Dudu, Noreen and Elrond will yeah. be able to use these <laughs> journals to get like prove my insanity. Uh, so yeah, there, there's two that I've lost over the years. Technically three. I, I lost one in Korea, and I always had like my name and phone number or an email mm-hmm. address back in the day. And I actually had a woman return one to me. Another foreigner wow. found one of That's them. That's amazing. That's, that is awesome. And she she was like, "All right, man, I'll." I'll put in like the post even though we're in the same city i was like man that's awesome like do uh i mean i'll I'll, like i'd like to take you out to dinner to thank you and apparently she thought that was creepy or i I don't know why but yeah she She probably read it and was like no no (laughs) (laughs) no thank you that's 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 okay (laughs) it it was my first year in korea dude that it definitely could not have been anything that would have inspired you to be like man even like if he's not hitting on me, I don't want to spend one meal with this person. <laughs> yeah, that's so that, that's it. There's two blank spots. Wow, that's amazing. I've heard that some. Sucks. I got on this kick a while ago where um, I got onto YouTube and I started watching these people that would go to Japan or foreign countries and teach. And just the nightmare stories that they had about it, like, because you're sold sort of in some of these businesses that bring you over are like crooked businesses and they bring you over there and it's just like you're basically a slave for, you know, for just minimal money and they treat you terrible. And so <clears throat> that, oh, yeah. it's pretty. Yeah, it sounds like you had a, a, a better uh, go of it <laughs> than the than second. Some. Right. Well. The, the university was also horrible, but in different ways. I mean, they paid steadily, but uh-huh. no, there, there's all sorts of horror stories over there. I've, I've had friends that, uh, like in Korea, the majority of the places you teach English are what they, they're after school academies that they call hagwon. And the hagwons are typically like in these office buildings. And I've had friends show up to work because they're usually like 2 to 9 p.m. You get to drink all night and sleep late. And that's why you get a lot of like semi-functional alcoholics over there right because uh, you know it's a lot of people recently out of college and they're just like all right we can party all night because the city never sleeps kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. <laughs> and then uh but they'll show up to their schools and the, the whole thing is just emptied there's just literally nothing left like wires hanging from the ceiling desk are gone wow. and you know like that's the people if that happened here, it'd be all screwed up, and there'd be a labor board you can complain to. But there, like your visa is based on that job. Right, like, you've right. got so much going on with that. Uh, but there are a lot of people that have been there for. I, I've got friends that have been there for a decade or two. That have they're they're like really quality companies. Yeah. I mean, you know, look for reviews and look for what people say. Uh, but there there are some great places, and and there's a lot of weird people there. Uh, a good friend of mine, <laughs> British Andy. He had been in town for a while when I was at the university, and he went back home to the UK, and he came back to the school that he chose because its building 
was across the alley from the building that had his favorite bar. So he'd show up for work anywhere <laughs> between like one and 3 PM. He'd finish his job teaching like, you know, anywhere from kindy to probably sixth grade kids. And then he'd walk across the alley and go close the bar down at four or 5 AM. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go catch that nap and go back to work. That's awesome, man. Wow. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's it's kind of like you, you think, like, you wish you had like a fit tracker or one of those things on him just to see, like, the fact that, man, he had these whole days where he probably, like, walked a thousand feet. <laughs> he just he was in the classroom he went to the bathroom twice he went to like the restaurant on the first floor of the building and then he went to the bar on the third floor of the next building and then he went to his home that was like maybe three minutes away right yeah. he, he had more, sort of more teachers ought to do that shit i think they'd be a lot happier especially here in the united states right. <laughs> <laughs> what's even the unhappy teachers over there are generally as, as long as they're getting paid they're generally happy because at Worst case, as long as you're being taken care of, you just come out with stories. Like I said, my high school was corrupt and horrific, but the stories I came out of it with were worth the toil and trouble, boil and bubble. Uh, same with the university, man. The corruption, the nonsense there. I just, I mean, it was enough that I stayed at the university for 13 and a half years. Wow, man. Yeah. Dang. And then I moved to, after all that, I was like, all right, I, I got married to this woman whose family's Korean Chinese. And she's like, hey, I've been here for like five, six years. I'm ready to go back to northern China. And that's where I'm coming out of now. And uh, I get there and I'm like, all right, I've spent 15 years in Korea. It's time to be in China and do Chinese things. So I ended up spending two years at a Korean international school in northeastern China. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smart like that. <laughs> Well, Sam, I know that you've got a lot more, a, a lot more, because uh, I've got a shitload written down that I was going to just quick shorthand notes that I wanted to talk about. And I know I know Adam wanted to hear some of our mm -hmm. uh, our college stories. So we're yeah. going to have to get you back on uh, yeah, sure. pretty soon. Maybe a part two. Yeah, I know. This was long, man. This is probably like when, when I tell it fully and. And I even skipped out a, a chunk or two of this one. But, yeah, most of my stories are definitely not nearly as drawn out and insane as this one. They're, they're, they're weirder in other ways, but, but uh, definitely a lot shorter. That's an epic. It's and an I'm, epic. I'm happy to do it, man. Yeah, it's an epic story, man, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It really is. <laughs> Hell of a test of stupidity. Hey Barry, yeah. have you ever seen have you ever seen a goat sucker? What? Goat sucker, chupacabra. Oh yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen one of those? I haven't seen one personally, but I've heard about them. Yeah, me too. If anybody's got a goat sucking story, wait. If you got a goat sucker story, we want to hear it. If you got a Bigfoot story, we want to hear it. If you got a Loch Ness monster story, or a Lake Champlain story, or Ogo Pogo story, or uh, an Oingo Boingo story, wait, that that was an '80s band. Anyway, you got a weird cryptid story, we want to hear it. I didn't even know what a cryptid was, man. Yeah, dude, cryptids. They're like uh, the animals that haven't been necessarily proven by science. They're the ones on the edge. You know, they're not necessarily known animals, but they're known animals. We don't have the bodies or anything like that. So they're kind of like uh, half myth, half story based in reality, but still in that weird mystery area that we don't know about yet. Cryptids are fun. Well, let me just say that uh, I appreciate meeting your guy's friend. He, uh, Sam, holy shit, man. This guy. <laughs> I would expect nothing, nothing less than what we got out of Sam. That's for damn sure. Yeah, dude, that's, uh, that's scratching the surface barely. Barely <laughs> scratching the surface with Sam. I mean, Lord, we've got so many stories, and yet, like I said early on so many stories that just cannot and should not be shared so. <laughs> yeah i you know uh somebody like sam was kind of they were born to be on this podcast because uh you know he has he, his whole life 
you know, and that's that's what his books are about. It's his his books. The it's the fictional the the fictional story of Richard Lickman. But actually, you Isn't know, it like Ninja Licious or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it's Ninja. We'll have some links. We'll we'll, we'll right. put those in there. So. Yeah, Ninja Licious, the fictional story of Richard Lickman. Uh, but so yeah, this is a guy that can write an entertaining book about his life, and uh, I mean, he he's he's such a great storyteller, and I don't know, uh, you know what I kind of prodded him to tell us about today was just, it was one of my favorite stories. You know, that's, that's one of the stories that I've, that I've always enjoyed. And, uh, I know he's got a lot more, so you're yeah. right, Adam. It is. It's, well, it's totally just scratching the surface. I can tell you right now that the stuff that he got into in, in, in those countries, <clears throat> it's very frowned upon because those sentences for, for, uh, for possession and you know it it it's steep dude and if you get caught you're gonna spend some time you're gonna spend some time and and i think the the i think a lot of those are like life sentences man you know right yeah i mean or more if you still be crazy yeah Yeah. dude yeah so it's but the fact that he was able to pull all that off dude is just insane (laughs) it's just insane (laughs) man it's insane I love it. It really is great, he, great uh, stuff. You know, when we when we first met him, I I really didn't know I really didn't know how to take this guy. He was really unlike uh, anyone that I had ever met. And you know, I don't know if I've said it on here before, but I'm kind of a a magnet for weird people, and I've I've got a lot of weird friends, and and I don't know it. It took a little while for 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 Sam to grow on me but boy when he did man I was I was all in yeah. I was all in on Sam so uh you have the most interesting uh group of friends I mean I just don't know anyone that doesn't like Jeff Hubbard I don't I've never met anybody that doesn't like Jeff oh, I knew one person but that was only because there was a girl involved okay well <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but but it's like it's just it's what's it's always fascinated me about you is your ability to just pull the best out of people, and you always you always found a way to to just like have inside jokes with everyone, mm-hmm. and everybody sort of shares in this fun, and you know that's just one of the things that i just really admire about you man i i i really i just love i love hubs lust for life and the ability to see the best in people man you know very oh, true thanks bear thank and and adam thanks for for backing him up on that i appreciate that guys thank you yeah, yeah. i you know i don't know yeah. i i'm a i'm a kind of a guy i guess that i don't get annoyed with people you know i What's the heck? You said I'm kind of a guy, I guess. I was like, no, you're a full guy, even <laughs> though there were so few times. You're a full guy. <laughs> That's a college man. <laughs> no, there were never any times. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, man. You know, I see people a lot of times, you know, people are like, yeah, that guy annoys me. And it really takes something. It takes somebody else telling me something like that before I ever recognize anybody's annoying qualities. So if, if, if people don't mention it to me, I'm just I'm down with them. Right. You know, I don't it, as long as somebody doesn't point it out. I'm right. I, I like I'm a lover of people. Yeah, and I think that's one that's that's an endearing quality, and I think it's just one thing. It's something about your personality where people feel like they can tell you anything. You know what I mean? So that just that says a lot about you, man. I mean, I and I have 
I have we, people want to tell me weird shit all the time too, man. You know what I mean? But but you have this just the ability to uh, connect with folks, and uh, Sam is just one of those dudes that just he fits the bill. When I think of a Jeff Hubbard friend, he's a guy that I'm like, okay, I can see, I know where, I know, I know the vicinity of where we're going here, man. But he, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just you never know where it's going to stop, man. It's just great. Yeah. That is so cool, man. Well, yeah. I know we're uh, Adam and I have, have been lucky to know Sam for the last twenty plus years, I guess. And now, Barry, you are uh, you're now in in the Sam Club too. Love it. So. I love it. I love it, man. I love it. Hey, and we a, hope- a friend of your guys, a friend of mine. You know. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. we hope that you guys listening loved Sam as well because. Uh, We're going to have some more. Um, We're going to take advantage of Sam being back and stuck here in the States, and we're going to be recording with him. And we're going to parse it out so you don't get over-Sammed. But uh, we're going to have some more Sam stories uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, for sure. So That's awesome. um, Stay tuned for those. Looking forward to it. They're going to be good, too. I'm looking forward to it, too. All right. Well, Hub, thanks for joining us. And Sam, thank you for being here and being our friend and sharing those rather uh, illuminated <laughs> and uh, unexaggerated stories because uh, Sam's not much for hyperbole either. All of that's straight up. So yeah. um, thank you that for for that. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, join us uh, next week. We have uh, we're going to talk to uh, Scott Martis, who was our uh, Lake, Sh- Lake Champlain uh, champ, uh, Lake Monster expert, and uh, talk with him about uh, his last uh, expedition. I guess cool. we would call it there yeah, yeah, from yeah. last summer, and also in a, uh, a really interesting experience that he had late one night. Uh, outside his house on his driveway so yes yes scott's uh, great cool. scott's great to talk so to him join man. us next yeah awesome dude awesome dude yeah. so yeah join us next week and until then be safe be weird as always if you have a weird story we want to hear it if you have a lot of them we want to hear them all we can't do this podcast without your invaluable contributions whether it's sharing your stories listening rating and spreading spreading the the word word about the podcast. podcast. Thanks for listening. Till next time, be safe. Be weird. The stories presented on the What's Your Weird Story podcast 